Hello and welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we take you through all the mistakes, failures, and explosions that made modern space exploration possible. We are your hosts, Quinn. Chris. A cold Chris. And today we are joined by guest Frost to talk about Operation Argus, the Cold War plan to cover America with a flying shield of radioactive death. So, Frost is a YouTuber who runs the Frost 4 channel where he uploads videos mostly about strategy games. I have been a big fan of his work for a while now, and since a lot of the games he plays often delve into the Cold War, alternate history, or space, we figured it'd be fun to have him on to talk about the period of history where any scientist with a doodle of a doomsday weapon could get billions in funding. Frost, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited about this. I know nothing about this period of history, really, apart from the alternate history stuff. And what I have heard about Project Argus is both terrifying and fascinating. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. That's the that's the best part about learning, like in my ex- limited experience learning about history is even if you think you know a time period, there's always going to be like dumber stuff to delve. There's just always going to be someone getting so much weirder with it. Than oh, God. Could yeah. Only. And we're going to talk about probably like every single time we talk about a weirdo or a lunatic on this channel, I say they're my new favorite. I said that Bob Truax was my new favorite. I'm just very impressionable, but this time we are going to talk about probably one of the weirdest guys to ever, like, do weird shit. I'm excited. It's, oh, it's, it's great. It's great. And I already knew a fair amount about, like, the Cold War paranoia and this time whenever everyone thought that everything should be nuclear, Operation Plowshare, all of that stuff. The late 50s, when both the Soviets and the Americans were just detonating as many test nukes as they possibly could. This puts them to shame. Oh, yes. So, have any of you guys ever heard of Operation Argus? Before this podcast, I have not. All right, that is fair. I need to, every time I ask this question, I always poison it for the audience because I have gotten so excited that I have hinted stuff to all of the (laughs) guests and hosts. So whenever I say like, oh yeah, have you ever heard of Operation Argus? Everyone can just say like, yeah, you've, you know, you've sent me a lot of stuff. (laughs) Yeah, Um, that's essentially, essentially where I'm at. I've been poisoned. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I've done everything I can to avoid learning more about it before right now. Yeah, I, I should just do these as surprises. I just get too excited. I'm sorry. Audience, <laughs> I'm also sorry to you. I do have a question. Sure. Is this, this is in the 50s, it's nuclear. Is this part of the US weapon series testing? Like, do you mean if it's part of the, the weapon testing that they're doing out in like the Marshall Islands? And Nevada, just nuclear test shots. So it is broadly part of the like ongoing thing of the U.S. doing these test uh, detonations. Also, audience, if you want to learn more about that, specifically out in the Pacific, uh, Lines Led by Donkeys has an old but very good episode called How the U.S. Poisoned the Marshall Islands. I would highly recommend you go listen to it. Honestly, we killed an island. (laughs) Yeah, I shouldn't I should not laugh about that. But uh... this is the stuff you don't learn about when you have a, a European education. You just don't really get a lot of this covered in in, 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 in your average upbringing. In complete fairness, we did not learn about this in school either. Uh, (laughs) I I didn't learn about it in Canadian school. I'm willing to bet you guys were not taught in history class. Oh, don't worry. We didn't even come close to this. So this is the stuff uh, you have to delve for the truly awful stuff. So basically, Operation Argus You guys know how nuclear explosions have an EMP effect to them, right? When an atomic bomb detonates, it lets out a massive electromagnetic pulse that can fry electronics for hundreds of kilometers, even like further than the blast zone. Uh, Yes, vaguely. Mm -hmm. Distinctly aware, mostly from all the strategy games I play that make great use of this mechanic. There we go. And there are... I knew we picked a perfect guest. And there are also ways to design the uh, physics package itself to be more conducive to... EMP generation than blast yield. You are right. Uh, And this is something that's actually like worked into modern nuclear strategy. 
For example, one plan was to like launch a single missile high over a target nation and then detonate it. So the EMP would like knock out communications and paralyze the enemy response while the real wave of nukes rolled in. And like you said, other Chris, some nations are even experimenting with super EMPs. So like ion bombs, or sorry, neutron bombs, like, and nuclear weapons that are designed specifically to make massive pulses, instead of just doing that as a byproduct. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have a pulse that's powerful enough, you can permanently destroy electronics, not just knock them out for a while. Yes. Radiation is, at the end of the day, particles moving at incredible speed, and things like um, a, a lot of the damage that we're going to talk about with Operation Argus is done by beta particles. It's like electron, it's, it's just singular electrons, and these do... If you get enough of them, they can, like, they, they have mass. They are, like, matter. And if they fly through electronics, they can physically shred it. One of the dangers of sending electronics into space is that if it goes on long enough, they will just get, like, microscopically turned into Swiss cheese by radiation just plowing through them. Basically, uh, that is all a long-winded way of saying that the link between nuclear weapons and EMPs is well understood, and it has been since the 1950s. But what if you could go a little further than that? What if, instead of letting that nuclear pulse dissipate, you could capture it and keep it for later? What if, and this is the true goal and genius of Operation Argus, you could avatar-style radiation bending to, like, shape that pulse and control it? Needless to say, we're talking about some supervillain shit today. This, this feels like pure science fiction. Uh-huh. <laughs> How do we get the jet stream to cooperate with where we want our cloud to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, uh, I I'm setting all of this up, and then I'm going to tell you that Operation Argus is actually just, like, a big fan and just, like, pouring polonium out in <laughs> into it and just, like, blowing it towards the enemy. <laughs> I can see why anyone in the military would be like, this sounds like something I want to have. So uh, I, know, I know I repeat this often, but, like, on our show... One of our favorite things is whenever a scientist goes to the military and is able to get like millions or billions of dollars in funding by just saying this could be a weapon. Like that's how the Sputnik gets launched. That's how uh, Werner von Braun launches the first American satellite. All of this is just got you just go to the military and you say, I have a weapon idea. It just conveniently looks like the thing I already want to do. <laughs> But before we get to any of Operation Argus, we need to talk about the physics that makes it possible and the insane dude who discovered it. For sourcing, I'll mostly be relying on the book Burning the Sky by Mark Wolverton, as well as a couple of articles. As always, all sources will be in the episode description. The Sputnik Panic. So, Sputnik. We all know Sputnik, right? It's about 200 pounds of steel, battery, and beep. It was the first satellite ever launched, and as a scientific instrument, it was completely pointless. Um, but that is also not what it was meant to do. Like a lot of stories on our podcast, this one starts on October 4th, 1957, when a little beepy ball was launched into orbit on top of a modified ballistic missile. More than just beeping for a few weeks, Sputnik set off a media and political firestorm that would shake the entire world. Oh, the Earth in the bottom right. That yeah, is I was, about to, I was about to bring that up. <laughs> that one is a Soviet um, cartoon, I believe. Look at my screaming child. The one next to it as well with the guy screaming at the sky. Yeah, that, that I believe is an American one, and it's meant to represent, like, all, the whole gist of all of this is that America is sleeping at the wheel while the Russians are getting ahead. If anyone's going to throw trash into space, it's got to be me. Be us. <laughs> so up to that point, the Soviet Union was largely viewed as a technological backwater, a brutish authoritarian state whose only prominence on the world stage came from its massive army. America was comfortably ahead in just about every metric that mattered in the Cold War. They had more nukes, more ways to deliver them, and more bases to store them. We talked about this way back in our first series, but Strategic Air Command under Curtis LeMay made it a policy to fly huge fleets of bombers clear over Soviet territory for no purpose other than intimidation. The U.S. was the dominating force at this time. You might have some technology, but hear me out. <laughs> I have enough bombers to cloud the sky. I have Lockheed and Boeing, and they have Compromot on me, so I'm going to keep to giving them money. Now, at the same time, Sputnik should not have been a surprise to anyone. The Soviets had very clearly stated their intent to launch a satellite during the International Geophysical Year, or IGY, which was a sort of International Science Olympics. They had also publicly announced successful tests of the R-7 ballistic missile, but in both cases, Western governments and media had laughed them off. Don't get tense. You know how complicated it is to build and launch a satellite. Those people will never be able to do it. 
That is a direct quote from General Metaris, the head of the U.S. Army's ballistic missile program, and it was about a week before Sputnik launched. This sort of national contempt was everywhere, and when it all came crashing down, it impacted just about every facet of American life. So they have spent so long going like, the Soviets cannot possibly do that. And then the Soviets do it, and everyone's suddenly like, oh, we're behind. How long was General Medeiros still a general after he said that? General Medeiros asked to retire. So the American missile program at the time, one of the reasons it was so delayed in launching a satellite was because the Army, Navy, and Air Force were all competing with each other and like siphoning off, which means all of the funding, every rocket only got a Split third of the ways. funding. Yeah. And General Metaris, he actually wound up winning the race. And the U.S. Army became, uh, like, they launched the first American satellite. So Wow, way to just trash my entire bit. What was your bit? Sorry, I didn't no, hear No, I just it. said that he gets fired immediately. Shit. Forced, forced to resign. <laughs> so, yeah, and there, there is a fun story where, like, he was... Because Werner von Braun, on top of being a Nazi, was also that same kind of personality that all rocket scientists are, where he's just like incredibly type A personality. And General Metaris, like one of his main roles was just like lassoing and controlling von Braun to prevent him from like saying something stupid to the president and getting all their funding cut. <laughs> saying <laughs> something like catastrophically wrestling, stupid. Wrestling his arm down from the Nazi salute whenever he hears an anthem. <laughs> he just has a shot collar around his leg. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a saw trap but it just like forces his arm back down at his side but yeah like sputnik at the end of the day was a huge impact like to american pride for the government it set off an immediate blame game the soviets had gotten to something first and that was not right if america wasn't first at a thing it was because someone had fucked up big time they pointed the finger at eisenhower who pointed the finger right back at them Politicians blamed a lack of education spending. They demanded huge networks of fallout shelters and founded all kinds of government research orgs that would go toe to toe with Soviet scientists. Critically, one of those was the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, better known today as DARPA. Oh, the source of all the true fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> America's toy books. The most militant. And it is kind of fun. Like they, they will not uh, talk about it as much. But all of the all of these organizations, all of these movements um, start in the immediate like paranoia racked response to Sputnik. When the, you know, U.S. government tax dial just goes from, you know, <laughs> yeah, and just and, a, a nice hose to full on fire. Blast. Yeah. And we did cover this way back in our first episode, uh, but audience as well. There is the very good book, uh, Red Moon Rising. And a lot of this kind of covers Eisenhower's like being in an impossible situation because his whole shtick was trying to rein in the U.S. budget. Uh, so he was like in charge of cutting funding everywhere. And then all of a sudden Sputnik launches and everybody has a proposal for how America can fight back. And every one of those proposals is like, I need a hundred billion dollars right now. No questions. What a time to be alive. <laughs> yes. What a I'm time to be an entrepreneuring used car salesman. If you, if you just had an idea for anything and you could push it well enough, I'm sure you could have gotten so much money. Oh, oh God, you could yeah. just affix yourself to the government money nozzle. Now, for the American public, the concern was a little different. They were under threat. While Sputnik itself was harmless, the Soviets had made it very clear that the R-7 was a missile first and that they could have easily swapped the satellite for a nuke. For the first time in literal centuries, an American rival had the power and capability to strike at them anywhere. It didn't matter that Soviet citizens were under infinitely more threat, with American bombers literally buzzing their cities. America's heartland was under threat, and that was not right. The media only served to stoke those fears until you had people organizing like Sputnik watch parties, and they even made petitions that the US government should just nuke it out of the sky, which is coincidentally what we're going to be talking about today. I'm just imagining the, the timeline that could have resulted if that had happened. Yeah, if, if just like the first satellite in human history two days after launch had just been struck by like an atomic missile. <laughs> It would have ruled. It also would have been like the most petty little thing America could have done. The biggest backhand in history. Yeah. Sputnik just flies over the horizon. Fucking shoot it down now. Do it. Unidentified fucking thing. <laughs> that, oh and, oh, where's the beeping ball, Mansley? <laughs> <laughs> and radioactive uh, waste just fucking showers over rural Idaho. Worth it. <laughs> just the hairs falling out, teeth are falling out. Take that ball. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it is kind of like 
take the take the Chinese spy balloon and just set it like 70 years earlier and just like fucking kill it. Kill it. Use our most advanced technology and blow it out of the sky. Just F-22 moment. F-22 <laughs> mentioned. Yes. <laughs> Finally, the response from American scientists was mixed. Rocket scientists like Werner von Braun cursed the government for holding them back or insisted that the Soviets had actually cheated by stealing American rocket secrets. Do not mention Paperclip. Don't mention Operation Paperclip. Don't mention how we stole German secrets. I was going to say, yeah. well, we can get away with stealing this stuff, but then I'm not American and I don't feel I can say that. Uh, <laughs> no, I think, I think you still can. I Two think of that, us are. And yeah, can, I, I, and I'm stuck. Canadian and I, can, I think I can pretty credibly say that... Uh, I mean, at the same time, um, the U.S., USSR, France, and Britain all had pretty competitive programs immediately after World War II to like grab up as much V2 uh, and like rocket know-how as possible. Operation Paperclip is just the most successful and most famous of those. Um, so that's how the rocket scientists are handling it. Meanwhile, physicists like James Van Allen were a bit more sanguine about Sputnik, seeing the achievement as one for mankind more than an American failure. Brilliant achievement. He wrote, also praising Korolev for picking a transmission frequency that could be picked up by anyone with a radio. Uh, so for those who don't know, the uh, first American planned satellite, uh, Vanguard, its radios were set to a kind of high frequency that could only be picked up by like researchers. Meanwhile, Sputnik, as like a very wise propaganda move, was beeping so that just anyone anywhere could pick it up. That's pretty smart. Yeah, but one man heard about Sputnik and got an idea. Nicholas Christophilos, a Greek-American scientist working on fusion reactors, knew the subtext of the Sputnik launch. He knew that the Soviets were advertising that they could drop an atomic warhead anywhere on the planet. And instead of panicking or getting mad that America hadn't been first, Nick decided that he was going to stop them. He came up with a plan to destroy any Soviet warhead or satellite that came anywhere near holy American airspace. The way you built that up, the way he sounds like such an American hero has me <laughs> extremely worried about what's coming next. Oh, the, our, our precious boy has some ideas, it sounds like. He's, he's a fun one. Um, and you can see his picture there on, I guess, slide 22, 21. Wait, no, no, you coined Chris... <laughs> Christophilos effect. We made the bit of that about the law of Chris attraction and how Chris is just always conglomerate. Listen, I'm I'm sorry, but we are seventy years too late. We're too late. Nicholas Christophilos. Just give me a second. I want to practice saying Christophilos. 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 <laughs> uh, I'm mostly just going to call him Nick from here on out. Our boy Nicky C. Our boy Nick Christ. <laughs> <laughs> defending holy american airspace yeah like nick christ is gonna be our weapon our our boy nicholas christ <laughs> <laughs> I, I i yeah like i guarantee you um like whenever he was growing up in boston people called him that nicholas nicholas now in 1957 nicholas christophilos was not exactly a well-established scientist Instead, he was an oddball, tolerated at best by his peers who had to endure long rants about whatever new idea he'd thought up that could change the world this time. Quote. He's just like me, for real, for real. <laughs> yeah, he was, he just wanted to tell people about his micro fixation. And like, is that so bad? <laughs> Christophilos didn't fit any of the popular scientist stereotypes. He tended more towards saggy blue suits, bright ties, and scuffed up black shoes than the tattered sweaters of Einstein. Nor was he thin and ascetic. He was sturdy and had an avid appetite for fine food and wine. Whereas Einstein was a famous pipe smoker, Christophilos preferred a steady stream of cigarettes. The accent was definitely there, a thick Greek variety that at times could be so heavy that some of his interlocutors wished he came accompanied with an interpreter. Calm and reserved, he definitely was not. A colleague once remarked that Christophilos could easily play both roles in an argument between a pair of cab drivers. That is an indictment. <laughs> yes. What a great description. Uh, he's, he's just like this incredibly boisterous dude. If he has an idea, I'm sure he's the kind of guy that would have just like taken you verbally hostage in the hallway on your way to your office. The exact opposite of gatekeeping. <laughs> with lots of pointing with an unlit cigarette. Yeah, <laughs> getting uncomfortably close and you can just smell the wine on his breath. No, that cigarette is lit and you are getting poked at least once. <laughs> <laughs> so like, all right, so like imagine this is the atomic heat of the sun jabs it into your chest. It's hot, right? <laughs> <laughs> you feel that, yeah? All right, so what if we did that with a nuke? <laughs> what if we made it bigger? 
<laughs> what if it just was, it felt that way over your entire body? Yeah. <laughs> All at once. Over and over again. Uh, at the same time, this, like, as I'm reading this after writing it, this does just sound like a superhero origin story. Maybe not the superhero origin, but like, this is the mad scientist that gives some kid superpowers. Because he's just like, he accidentally locks him in the fusion reactor. Sends him in to get his, get his six pack that he left in there. <laughs> oh, I dropped my lighter. Hang on. <laughs> it's made from this new element we found. It's really heavy. Now, he'd been born in Boston to first generation Greek immigrants, but his parents moved back to Athens when Nick was seven. He grew up a tinkerer, building his own radios, training to be an elevator repairman, and reading books on nuclear physics in his spare time. So he is like genuinely incredibly smart. His plan was to get an education in engineering in Athens, then move back to the state so he could study at, NI at MIT. Now, this was in 1938, so needless to say, his plans got derailed a little bit. In 1940, Mussolini's Italian army invaded Greece, and they got immediately ground into paste. The Greek army counterattacked, retook all their territory, and then counterinvaded into Italian occupied Albania. On it. <laughs> On yeah, like, victories. <laughs> huge 180. Uh, Mussolini then had to beg for help from the Germans, who were able to blitz through the battered Greek army, and suddenly Little Nick was living under Nazi occupation. Yeah, because they're too busy boot stopping the Italians into a <laughs> fine red paste. Oh, God. I don't want to just make this uh, like, oh, nothing but sending our audience to go listen to lions led by donkeys more but just there's a very good series of <laughs> just the italian troops being so terrified of the greeks that like one greek soldier reportedly bit the italians <laughs> repeatedly <laughs> what it's fun and just kind of more of like everybody always i always find it weird that everybody always like oh the the french surrendered and whatnot whenever like the italian army is right there you can make fun of them so much easier morale national pride people it'll do things Oh, the Italian army. Professionalized incompetence. So, yeah, Greece gets occupied, the elevator company he worked at was nationalized, and Nick was given the choice of either repairing German military vehicles or executed on the spot as a potential saboteur. Uh, he picked the repair job. Ah, a real choice. Do we have to cancel him now? <laughs> oh. Ah, uh, yes. Face the we, wall. We can do that for other things later, don't worry. <laughs> this is the, the, the most minor of, of, of issues. Yeah, and I mean, at the same time, he was working pretty much with a gun to his head the whole time, um, because on top of just uh, like not trusting people that they had occupied and were oppressing, uh, the Greeks also had that whole racial inferiority thing of anyone that wasn't them, and Greeks definitely fit that profile. Now, aside from getting almost firing squatted, Nick was able to ride out the war in relative peace. One very minor perk of Nazi occupation was that he got access to German scientific papers that he spent almost all of his free time reading. What particularly interested him was the new field of particle accelerators. And being Nick, he immediately threw out all of the conventional designs and started to invent his own. That's not a red flag at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like some kid who's just, yeah, I can do that better. Just look at all of the uh, Nazi scientists, no pow sand, you don't know what you're doing. Let a real man do it. <laughs> See, back then, every particle accelerator was massive. Think industrial scale magnets, like just to get them to work. Huge power draws. I'm not really going to get into the weeds on physics here, but Nick invented something called the strong focusing principle that basically used alternating magnets to direct particles in an accelerator. And the whole, like, basically in the way they describe it is the old method was you had to have uh, magnets mounted along like every axis. So like X, Y, Z. And then all of the magnets would fire at the exact same time and they would like brute force the particle along the path it was supposed to go. And this was like massively wasteful. And Nick invented this idea of like, well, like what if you fire them like one at a time and you just kind of like nudge a particle this way and then nudge it that way and then nudge it this way and just do that really fast. This does work. Uh, this is and this allows them to be both much cheaper, uh, easier to build, a lot smaller and like the power draw drops ridiculously. Because the size of the old magnets was the bottleneck to building bigger and faster accelerators, this basically cleared the way for all kinds of massive new cyclotrons and synchrotrons and betatrons and all that stuff. What about the sigmatrons? Whoa. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go through the list, uh, like the whole list, because I, I didn't want to dive into like particle accelerator stuff. I'm willing to bet a sigmatron does exist out there. Okay, I'm 
Give me a second. Oh, he's going to go look. So Nick patented the idea in 1950 and sent off a letter to the University of California's radiation lab, who completely brushed him off. They sent him a note explaining why he was wrong and his idea was stupid and eventually just routed all of his letters into a crackpot bin that they had. To be completely fair, like after World War II, and we are after World War II at this point. Yeah, this is 1950. All kinds of scientists all over the world, like they were just getting letters from random people, like actual crackpots just saying like, hey, this is my idea. Will you hire me? Will you get me to America? Will you let me work on nuclear weapons and stuff like that? So them getting a letter from a Greek elevator repair guy, I can understand being a little skeptical of that, but it also seems like they didn't read it. I'd love to be that, like look back at these people who who push these ideas aside out as gets a crackpot when their name is at the top of the list and being like okay he's cr- project argus it's yeah 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 now here's where we get to a problem because two years after the california scientist told nick that his idea was dumb scientists at the brookhaven national lab in new york on the opposite side of the u.s they invented the strong focusing principle again and they got the credit for completely reinventing the field of particle research. Uh, so <laughs> Nick has just been scooped. I'm I sure he scooped. Loved that. Yeah. He had a bag thrown over his head and pulled out <laughs> back and worked over a bit. So uh, this wasn't actually malicious. See, because Nick had patented his idea and not published it, it was still stuck somewhere in the patent office and no one at the Brookhaven lab knew about it. Uh, but that didn't matter. They had stolen the credit and ideas of Nicholas Constantine Christophilos, and they would pay. He hired a law firm, moved to America to confront them in person, like went up and knocked on their door, and forced them to give him credit. And then, once he had the credit and ownership of the principal, he sold it back to them for $10,000, or about $130,000 today. And then he retired, and that's the end of the story. (laughs) Yes. No, his his ego is currently, you know, a nice bonfire. It is getting stoked. It is working perfectly. He is being activated. (laughs) He's completely self-taught. He's very driven, and he's an expert at pissing people off. He made enemies so well that when he moved to the U.S., a number of scientists thought that the whole patent debacle was actually an act to sneak a Soviet agent into their labs. They're just like, yeah, there's no way he actually knows this stuff. Look at him. He's, He's definitely a KGB guy. It's just an elevator repairman. I, at, at the same time, there was a lot of that. Like there was classism or like and people going like, A, he's Greek. B, he's an elevator guy. How could he possibly have a good idea? If you think about it really hard, I mean, a particle accelerator is kind of like an elevator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's just like goes, watching, it an just ele- he's just watching someone get into an elevator, Nick going up and he's just like, what if I could get that up to like 10%, 10% of light speed? What if I could just what do if that? Those, what if those people were particles? <laughs> what is an elevator but a particle accelerator for people? <laughs> what, yeah, it's just, I mean, at the end of the day, it is just accelerating a lot of particles uh, in the shape of a person. So, you know, who's to say? So Nick got a job at the Brookhaven lab, like the same one that had stolen his idea. Oh, I bet he was popular there. Yeah, it was basically like their apology to him. Uh, And he starts working on the new accelerator that he'd basically invented. But some of that suspicion meant that it'd be three years before he got his security clearance. So I was going to say, did someone in America actually do do, due diligence at that time? I mean, kind of shocking. Yeah, he's a guy who's lived under Nazi occupation and in that capacity worked for the Nazis. And then there's also suspicions that he's a Soviet spy. And I do kind of find it kind of funny that they let him work on the particle accelerator before he got his security clearance. Like that was considered something that's like, no, 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 that's that's small time work. You go do that. But he, he did invent it. You can't really keep him from working on it. Exactly. Yeah. If, if you if you don't, he's going to go back to Greece and he's going to build it in his garage and it's going to like destroy half of Athens. <laughs> this angry <laughs> Greek like man the, has the, the pipes, the, the like steel pipes that he's using are going to burst and atomize all of Greece. <laughs> Listen. As far as they know, and as far as we know, the angry Greek man, he had the secret sauce. But once he got that security clearance, he was able to move to California and work on his real dream, fusion reactors and nuclear weapons. Did he actually start working at the place that threw his letters into the loony bin? I don't believe he started working at the University of California okay. Radiation Lab. Like He started working on, a nuclear, we- uh, on nuclear weapons at a nuclear weapons lab. Uh, which I think was beyond the uh, the radiation lab stuff. But do we think that after he moved to California, he resisted the urge to go to that lab? Oh, he oh, absolutely no, he... would have gone and just like, 
taken found his uh his original letter in the trash i mean i he probably should have thanked them at the end of the day because they made him ten thousand dollars richer they got him credit for his idea and they and he was now like an established scientist in the u.s oh i like to think he guaranteed drove past their front door and whipped a beer can beer bottle at it (laughs) Uh, so now he's working on nuclear weapons and this is how we come full circle back to sputnik and i know that was a lot of talk but i want you all to have an idea of the kind of guy the hero of this story is he's brilliant he's confident and his way of thinking is incredibly unconventional which is why when Sputnik launched, Nick didn't see it as part of a bigger space race. He saw the satellite itself, Sputnik 1, as a problem to solve, and he decided to destroy it. Yes, because that satellite is here to attack and dethrone God. Therefore, we must pluck it from the American <laughs> he, he sky. He's kind of just like immediate in, impulse in, reaction out. Satellite is up there. I don't like it. Kill it. <laughs> remove it from my presence (laughs) what you're building up here for me is the image of a guy that in the right place at the right time could change the world and in the wrong place at the wrong time could be the subject of a book called burning the sky yes because his idea and this is like he immediately goes to his boss and just starts giving him one of his like trademark arm flailing rambles multiple cigarette pokes to the face (laughs) Yes. <laughs> All right. Now imagine this is the warhead and your face is America. <laughs> Hold very still for a second. And this ashes flow fall out. <laughs> so his plan was to build an artificial radiation belt and smack it right on top of America. Oh, we are dousing them. Yeah, this is some science fiction shit. Now, I am not a physicist, so if I get things wrong, please don't get mad at me unless it's like really wrong. But basically, the Earth has a magnetic field. This is continuously being pumped out by the Earth's core, and it's shielding us from the solar wind, a stream of charged particles that are blasting out of the sun all the time. It was also believed at the time, but not confirmed, that the Earth's magnetic field could trap some of that solar wind and shape it into rings. Uh, So this is actually true, and this is what we now know today as the Van Allen belts. Anyway, Nick's idea was that if the geomagnetic field could influence and trap solar radiation, why not artificial radiation? What if you detonated a nuke in space in just such a way that the charged particles from the bomb would get trapped over a certain area? If you pulled it off, you'd wind up with a cloud of radioactive debris floating just above the atmosphere, packed dense enough that any warhead or satellite flying through the cloud would be fried. Nicholas Christophilos wanted to shroud the United States in a death cloud. I'm just taking a second to digest that. (laughs) Sorry, I was (laughs) muted. That is... That is metal as fuck. I know. <laughs> it rules. Like, it sucks. It's, it's horrible. If it had, I, I'm only if it left, had worked, I'm only, it would be horrible, but it is so no, cool. It absolutely I'm only sucks. left thinking about how much this sucks. I yeah. Mean. It, it is also, at the same time, like, uh, what I love about it is it's kind of the ultimate um, isolationism. Because that death cloud is going to be there for your, like, American rockets, too. This is basically just saying, like, the United States will never go to space. And that is fine. We are going to line our borders like we're going to take the death cloud and we're going to pull it down until it meets the earth and all of the United States will live inside of the radiation dome. How do you spin this to the American public? Like, (laughs) citizens of America, the death cloud will protect us from the perfidious Russians. (laughs) What do you mean? It's a comforting blanket. (laughs) Nicholas Christophilos is going to tuck you into safety. This is just, no, this is this is the most hell divers thing ever. It I is. know I know that all four of us have been playing hell divers a fair bit recently. So no, you, this is the most like super earth would douse itself in radiation to keep no. the evil automatons away. Now listen, you've heard of the iron curtain. <laughs> yeah. But how about uh, the nuclear blanket? What about the glowing curtain? The, the nuclear, nuclear blanket. Scheme. blanket. <laughs> <laughs> It's oh. like a Snuggie. <laughs> uh, in the, partnership with Snuggie. <laughs> ignore the fact that the air tastes like metal Dude, now. I, I, bet, I bet if you built the death cloud, you could do skywriting with like a satellite or a rocket or something. You could write brought, like, brought to you by Snuggie in the death cloud. So that, <laughs> so that every American walks outside and they just look up and there's just this huge green haze horizon to horizon. And they just know that and they know that they are safe. <laughs> And meanwhile, the Soviets have, like, conquered the entire rest of the world. It's the lead-lined thermonuclear stucky. <laughs> Go outside and praise. <laughs> Great, now I need to get someone to do, like, 1950s-style art of that. Can someone throw this up on Etsy? I want to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> now, even for a Nick idea, this was pretty out there. 
but a couple of factors meant that it was taken seriously. First, Nick did have some experience with this. His work on fusion mostly involved containing plasma within magnetic fields. So this would just be the same thing on a global scale and exactly as easy. Just scale it up. <laughs> yeah, it's, this is one to one. I mean, come on, light that candle. Let's get going. This, Chip chop. Yeah. <laughs> Time is money, baby, when you're Nick. An elevator is exactly the same thing as a particle accelerator at the end of the day. And a nuclear reactor is exactly the same thing as the planet Earth and America, the nation and concept at the end of the day. So, like, I don't, like why, why is everyone doubtful? And the second reason was that it was the height of the Sputnik panic and no one in America was thinking right. U.S. officials were scrambling for a response to the new Soviet ICBM threat, either out of genuine worry or, you know, at the end of the day, maybe just to cover their own asses and appease the public. Christophilos was offering a solution. If his plan worked, it'd nullify Soviet ballistic missiles and put America back on top. Side note, America was still very much on top of the nuclear game. The R-7, the first ICBM, it only became operational in 1959, two years later. And at, the, like, at their peak, the Soviets only ever had like 20 of them actually armed with warheads. Meanwhile, the Americans had literally thousands of atomic bombers all around Europe and just able to like, and they were bringing out the B-52, they were on top. This was purely American delusion. And at this point in time, guidance is, you know, just light the candle, hope it goes in the general direction. Yeah. Is this before or after pigeons as a, as a potential guidance? Oh, method? God. <laughs> oh, no, this is far after. Pigeons was a uh, World War II. Yeah, so, so they've got, you know, they've moved up. They're at like crows now, significantly smarter. They've taught a parakeet. We, we, have, taught a, we have taught a parrot to, uh, to recite uh, half of Marx, and we have put him in charge of the rocket. <laughs> oh, no, they would have just done that with Laika. Laika would have oh, just no. kamikaze the first warhead oh. into Washington. But no, listen, I'm still a big fan of uh, pigeons were the first anti-ship missile. Hell yeah. Just trying to peck at the screen. <laughs> now, all of that meant that Nick was taken seriously, but what pushed him over the edge and made sure that the government would buy into his plan was that he came up with a way to use this as a weapon. So because the like the geomagnetic field lines, because they come out of the Earth's surface in one place and go back in in another, that effectively links those two places. And because of that, like depending on where you launch the atomic bomb, you can launch it far away from where you want to set up the shield. The, the, the particles will travel along the field line and they will set up a shield at the opposite point from wherever you detonated. And also because wherever you set up a death cloud, that area is going to have a lot of trouble using things like radar and radios. If Americans wanted to set up a death cloud over the Soviet Union, they could paralyze any response to an American attack. It's like a nationwide flashbang against yeah, all of your electromagnetic exactly. equipment. You'll see that they've kind of got it um, like mapped out. If you wanted to put a shield over America, you would have to detonate in kind of the South Pacific. But if you wanted to put a shield, uh, like a radar dampening shield over Moscow, you would have to detonate in like the Indian Ocean. And this was actually a positive because it meant that like there would be no warning. You could go in the middle of the Pacific where no one is looking or the middle of the Indian Ocean. You detonate there and then all of a sudden Moscow wakes up covered in death cloud. The perfect weapon. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, it does appear, though, to have one, uh, one, one problem. How do you deal with the South Atlantic anomaly? Well, that, that'll it's come someone later. else's problem. Yeah, that just means Argentina is problem. immune. <laughs> the, <laughs> one, <laughs> the, one, the one part of the world immune to the American death cloud. <laughs> uh, so you can bet that the American government was exactly dumb enough to buy this idea. And with that, Operation Argus was born. The arm, the top, the top army brass are like, I'm a soldier, not a scientist. <laughs> Explain it to me. I'm paid to lead, not read. <laughs> no, all this is, is I'm going to fart hard at the Soviets. They're yeah. going to die. <laughs> Observe. Uh, Nicholas Christophilos, uh, Nick Christ, American hero, is going to fart in their general direction. Again, I, I mentioned it before, but how do you spin this to the American public? Oh, it turns out you don't. Thermonuclear snuggie. <laughs> <laughs> the branding is right there. Yeah, you, you just don't tell them and you don't tell the world. It'll be our little secret. It's, it's, just, it's just cosmic radiation. I'm sorry, Moscow. It's just, it's just cosmic radiation. Listen, just it could have come, come from anywhere. Do you guys get sunlight over there? 
boom. I, 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 that's where it came from. I don't know what you Cosmic want me to tell you. Cosmic uh, radiation just sounds like you have bad vibes. Stop it. All, all we did was it was explode a nuke over the, the ocean. We were just doing some testing. Sorry. I, yeah, we, we messed up. Uh, we, someone put in a zero where they shouldn't have, and we turned off your sky. <laughs> If you if you wait a little while, maybe it'll come back on again. No, that's exactly it. We turned off their. Sky. Yeah, it is just you turn off their sky. No one can go up there anymore, and like all of their radar just stops Russian working. Russian citizenry just looks towards the sky, and it's the Gmod default, like pink and black <laughs> texture. The Americans now possess the power to steal your textures. <laughs> Operation Argus and Task Force Eighty Eight. And Operation Argus was not a small project. Christophilos' idea was given massive priority and basically infinite resources by the US government. Engineers immediately set to work modifying a handful of X-17 sounding rockets to carry small nuclear warheads. Meanwhile, a new satellite, Explorer 4, was being specially designed to track the Argus detonations, and the US Navy started prepping an entire carrier battle group, Task Force 88, just so that it could launch these test rockets. I know this happened quite a while ago, but I, I'm actually getting anxious reading how fast this progressed. Uh-huh. Oh, no. It, <laughs> at this point in time, the U.S. government, if you spoke the right words, they would get really weird with it really quick. So, so there is actually a reason why it's going this fast, and it's not a good one. Oh, sorry. Keep it together. Keep those vocal cords loose. I know. I know. that I can feel them. They're, yeah, vocal cords are just like muscles. You use them, they tear, they grow back stronger. Then eventually you can just blow uh, someone's ears out. Yeah. yeah, that sounds that sounds plausible enough to be true. I yeah, guess. Yeah, it's it's. I just do primal scream training. Have a wait a week. <laughs> and again, I I want to be clear on this. They task an entire carrier battle group. So like they have an aircraft carrier. They have something like twenty other ships. More than four thousand five hundred sailors wind up going on this mission. And like the fourth American satellite ever, Explorer Four was secretly being designed only to test these Argus detonations. They needed a satellite up in space in order to see if it worked God, or not. this is so cool. <laughs> yeah, and this is just like, yo, some crazy Greek dude shouted at the president, and uh, now <laughs> I guess we're turning off the sky. Now Fuck we're Argentina. going to fry Explorer 4 for the science. The Greek mystic has determined it so. Make it happen. The Oracle. The Oracle of Delphi is just this <laughs> the, 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 or the Oracle of Christophilos. I don't really know what the science is here he was shouting about elevators and flicking cigarette ash in yeah. my face i just gave him the money <laughs> i just yeah i just wanted him to go away i so just said yes flicking cigarette ash in my eye i like your words funny magic man he would be able to give the most effective elevator pitch because he would get in and then like manually disable the elevator until you tell him like oh yes. he is hitting the e-stop he is pulling circuits he is putting cigarettes out on your face until you yes. say yes. Now, I also want to give not warning, but like the way this story works. As soon as the proposal is done, Christophilos kind of stops being involved. Like he is not going out and leading the terrier, the carrier. He gets the ball rolling. He is around as a scientist. But from this point on, the U.S. Navy is in control and they are going to play with nukes in Probably one of the most unsafe ways I have ever heard of. You can see Task Force 88. So that's just like a small selection of the ships they've got. Uh, they've got a, yeah, like a full on aircraft carrier. You can also see the launch on slide 16 there of one of these little rockets. Oh, it, if for a nuclear carrying rocket, it is not ascending that fast. You can also notice that it veers off to the side pretty quickly. Uh, make a note of that. I'm lucky my cats are asleep. Also, this is like, at least for the ships. Oh, those cruisers. That's like my favorite era or one of my favorites. Like the very earliest missile cruisers. This is honestly getting concerningly high fleet <laughs> <laughs> at a rapid pace. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, we do. We have we have modified cruisers that are launching uh, jury rigged atomic rockets that have very little guidance. <laughs> The plan was for Task Force 88 to steam out to the South Atlantic and fire its Argus rockets into space where they would detonate and Explorer 4 would be ready to analyze the resulting radiation field. Now, this wasn't meant to make a radiation shield over the US. Remember that the optimal place for that is somewhere out in the Pacific. They picked the Atlantic because of something called the South Atlantic Anomaly, an area just over Argentina where the Earth's magnetic field becomes incredibly weak 
And that also means that it is a hot spot for solar radiation. I don't, I'm, I haven't checked, but I feel like there might be like more cancer rates in that area because you can see in that map there, uh, the earth's like magnetic field strength just plummets. Yeah, that is screwed if that's actually true. Just the earth has decided no. No, that right there, <laughs> this, this particular part, Uruguay, don't need it. Burn it out. <laughs> it's, the earth is just focusing a magnifying glass on itself in this one spot. South American listeners, we love you. Stay safe. Uh, yeah, like, do not go outside. Do not look at the sun. The sun is much uh, more dangerous for you than us. the earth. I happen to be in a place with a lot of geomagnetic field strength. So, you know. Oh, look at I'm, you. I'm, I we... feel like I'm pretty lucky there. Oh, look at you with your nice geomagnetic strength. I mean, you're in like the same area, Chris. Let's not yeah. <laughs> get carried away here. <laughs> We need to make that as part of our introductions is we just list off the uh, the geomagnetic field strength of wherever we are and use that to identify <laughs> just like, oh, you, fu- you fucking radiation laden peasant. <laughs> I've got the benefit of the mega magnet. What have you I got? I am unspoiled by the sun. <laughs> I mean, at the same time, like the places on this map where you can see that it is like the most geomet like Australia, I'm looking at it here and it's like if you go up 100 kilometers. It's, it seems it's to scary. change drastically over the course of Australia. It's very interesting. If you look at the actual um, vegetation across Australia, it does kind of get a little bit more barren the more that you get. Okay. I feel like we're, I mean, at the same time, we could just be doing the biggest stretch imaginable. Uh, <laughs> and like saying that like very tiny differences in the Earth's magnetic field are just like, oh, so that's why Argentina is like that. We are just cranking the pseudoscience Wasn't the, now. um, the, uh, that hole in the ozone also near where the South Atlantic anomaly is? Uh, possibly? Let me, let I me look that up. In Australia. No, I thought it was like right over Antarctica, it looks like. Australia has, um, a really high proportion of UV radiation. I don't know why. Ew. Oh, okay. It is interesting, though, just how, like, I mean, part of it is just because the Earth is not a sphere, but how non-uniform so much of that is. Like, the, uh, the magnetic field is really uh, weird. The ozone layer is really weird. UV dispersion is really weird. Um, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of us here, but how 100% sure are we that the Project Argus testing didn't make the South Atlantic anomaly <laughs> any worse. Oh, oh God. No, 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 cut his mic. <laughs> uh, all right, yeah, we're, we're going to do a live show out in Argentina. We're just going to see if, like, there's this weird crackle in the background of my mic and I can't make it go away. <laughs> so to kind of loop back to that, they picked Argentina and they picked the South uh, Atlantic anomaly basically because detonating bombs here, like they felt that the nuclear radiation wouldn't drift and that it would be contained in the anomaly. And this was uh, and also that it could be hidden against the heightened background radiation caused by the anomaly. So this was important because Operation Argus was also supposed to happen under total secrecy. Because nuclear weapons and uh, secrecy definitely go hand in hand. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And the lengths they went to with this are actually kind of horrifying and fun at the same time. So some parts of keeping Argus secret were easy. Like the grad students who were working on the Explorer 4 satellite, they were just told to keep their mouth shut or they'd be sent to prison or shot. Um, And that worked. It's a very Russian attitude. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's with a 45 instead of a macro. So Soviet, 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 Soviet. <laughs> what would, how would it be if this happened today? You know, that would be bad. That'd be bad news if the government threatened to shoot anyone. Yeah. Shoot students. No, you just go on a one-way <laughs> trip to Guantanamo. Ooh, fair, fair. <laughs> getting, getting sent to Guantanamo, but you're a physicist, so you're just like, no, the radiation levels. <laughs> I want to stay where the magnetic field is strongest. <laughs> you're going to Argentina. So for the Navy, though, it was a little bit more difficult. Task Force 88's cover story was that they were going to go test some new kind of surface to air missile, which would explain why they were off in the middle of the ocean shooting rockets. But that story wasn't just for the public. It was for the crews of Task Force 88 who had no clue they were about to be involved in a nuclear test. Hmm. Now, by 1958, the U.S. Navy had a lot of experience with nuclear testing, like we talked about, you know, completely irradiating the Marshall Islands. And standard operation was to give every sailor a film badge that a detective they had been exposed to dangerous amounts of radiation. And Task Force 88 did have enough of these tags for everyone, more than 5,000. But they didn't hand them out because, like, if you're going on a mission to test a surface-to-air missile and your commanding officer gives you a radiation tag, 
you might suspect there's some going to be some nuclear stuff involved. So in order to keep the secret of Operation Argus safe, they did not disperse any of this anti-radiation oh, gear. Oh, perfect. <laughs> that sounds like such a great plan. <laughs> We're really uh, hitting some classics. And I have a quote here from Burning the Sky that explains their reasoning. The security aspects of the Argus experiment precluded the operation of the type of radiological safety program that is common to nuclear testing. It was therefore decided that the interests of the government should be protected against possible future lawsuits by a radiological safety program that would not reveal to personnel of the task force that nuclear testing was involved in their operations. So basically, they didn't want to get sued. And in order to not get sued, they thought the best way to do that was to just not tell guys they were being irradiated. They can just be involved in a later nuclear test where they know about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just make sure that every one of those guys gets like scheduled for 12 x-rays after. <laughs> and then we can cover it up. No, that huge lump on your neck. Um, it's just that's just scurvy. Yeah, it's not service related. <laughs> oh, you got the uh, you got the South Atlantic lumps. Yeah, we'll cut that right out of you. What do you mean the quartermaster says there's all these tags in in, in the hold? <laughs> they must just be misdelivered. Those are scurvy tags. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sir need to eat an orange. Now, secrecy wasn't the only problem Argus had to deal with because they were also under incredible pressure to get everything done by November 1958. And remember, this program starts in, like, March of 1958. Oh. This really is move fast and break things. Yeah. <laughs> and the break things is atomic bombs. Move fast and irradiate your sailors. See, Khrushchev and Eisenhower had agreed on a nuclear test moratorium. Basically, that starting in November, both the U.S. and USSR would stop doing nuclear tests. This was meant to cool some of the arms racing that was going on and give both sides scientists time to figure out what kind of impact detonating hundreds of nuclear bombs might have on the world, which, spoiler, is not a good one. And while you might expect both sides to honor the spirit of the agreement and either ramp down their tests before November or just stop them early, the announcement of the moratorium actually kicked off both sides trying to cram as many tests as possible in before they lost the chance. Like, as soon as this is announced, both sides are just like, all right, like, detonate everything. Doesn't matter. So like we said, Operation Argus had been approved in March of 1958, and it needed to be done by November. So they have an eight-month window to build a satellite, organize a carrier battle group, and modify rockets to carry nuclear warheads, which is basically impossible. But we did it. They did it. They, they did, did the it. impossible. They succeeded. How many quarters they cut, we'll never know. <laughs> Those heroes. I, I don't have it written in here, but um, what they also talk about in the book was because this, if, if soldiers got irradiated, they had no real way of knowing because they had not officially been involved in a nuclear test. And because these guys didn't know, if the plan went perfectly, they would not know until they were older, until like suddenly they got cancer. So the system that they had was basically... If anyone who was proved to be involved in Operation Argus got a specific kind of cancer within like 30 years after, they would just get a small stipend as a like, oh, sorry. I, mm, sorry, we uh, accidentally irradiated you. Sorry, your DNA is a little funky now. Here you go. <laughs> so one symptom of this rush was in the nuclear warheads themselves. See, because of how tiny the rockets were, these had to be as small and light as possible. And because they didn't have the time to build their own warheads, the Argus planners just took some W-25 nukes from the Air Force, who were designing it to be part of the Genie nuclear air-to-air -air missile. Because, again, it was the 50s and building a nuclear air-to-air -air missile was, you know, considered reasonable at the time. Sounds all right. I mean, I guess you don't have to be that accurate. You don't have to aim. That's actually the interesting thing about the Genie and something we will talk about. It had no guidance system because they just considered like it'll blow up everything within a few miles. So you just aim it vaguely in the direction of the Soviet Union and you'll probably hit something. <laughs> uh, I would I would love to see all of those packed into one of those like multiple those like rocket pods on a plane. Oh, no, and just no, fire no, off no, like no, no, 50 no, no, genies. No. Stop that. <laughs> Save it for Ace Combat 8. Oh, God, can't wait. But in 1958, the W-25, this warhead they'd picked, was incredibly new, and it had been tested precisely once. They also didn't have time to rig up any kind of advanced trigger, so they just used a timer instead. Quote, This nuclear warhead had nothing but the simplest fuse. It was ignited by the acceleration of the rocket. It was going to run for whatever the time was at the end of which it was going to detonate. That's all there was to it. Once it was started, there was no way of turning it off. This sucks so hard. <laughs> this is the craziest thing I have ever heard. I know. <laughs> when you told me about the timing system for 
Oh, my oh God. the uh, the it? APO. It which was no, three, no, no, which no, was no, just like three this kitchen is going blocks back in time. fused yeah, together. Even further than the APO, that was uh, R7. Oh, the um, I think it was like one of the early Sputniks had a timer that was just built out of uh, clocks that a guy found. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, but this this is this is two less clocks. This yeah, is just this one. Is just one clock, and at the end of it, it is it is triggered by something moving. It could be the rocket. It could be someone. I don't know. Maybe jostling the warhead a little bit. Uh, it's going to go boom after, I believe it was 700 seconds. And you've airbursted your task force. Nice. <laughs> and there's absolutely no way you can stop it. No. <laughs> Once it is activated, it is going. And this could be a problem since the X-17 rockets that would carry the warheads, they also didn't have any kind of controls. They were just big, dumb fireworks. If a rocket failed early, if it fell back into the sea, or if it even just like, if the, only the first stage fired and it just started falling back to Earth, it would fall onto Task Force 88 with a triggered nuclear warhead more powerful than the one that destroyed Hiroshima. So they, there was actually the chance that they would just airburst a fleet. Yes, who, it was who, a very who, real chance. It's always sunny title card of Task Force 88 accidentally nukes Argentina. The gang screws up a timer. <laughs> Nick nukes Buenos Aires. <laughs> that almost happens. Somewhere in the chain of command. There, there would have been at least one person who knew all of these facts. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and approved it, even, even knowing how many ways this could go wrong. So we're actually just about to get to that because the crew, the, like the 4,000 or so main crew of Task Force 88 did not know any of this. Only the captains of the ships, like their upper officers and the very small launch crew that would actually be in charge of launching these rockets. And would any of you guys like to guess how much training those launch crews got on these nuclear warheads? Less than six weeks. Okay, you're correct there. Oh, God. So these are a standard just sounding rocket, right? That they've just done some adjustments to? Yes. Uh, they probably got yelled at by some Air Force guys. So, so the actual answer is uh, they all did a three-week course. Oh, that's totally sufficient they they had not worked with rockets before and they had not worked with nuclear warheads i don't know what the breakdown was maybe it was 50 percent nukes 50 percent rockets uh but they they were good to go so as a layman to rocketry what would you say would be the optimum training period for this kind of mission i years years <laughs> a, a, lot, sounds... a lot of time uh ideally you would also just have like you could have some new trainees on stuff. I am, I am also not an expert, but like I'd imagine you'd want to have some new trainees and then some mid-tier guys and then some high-tier guys. All they had was the guys who went on the three-week course. They did not have any experts with Here's them. Here's how to light the bottle rocket. Here's how to twist the kitchen timer. Cheers. Like, if you're an expert in rockets or nuclear bombs, are you going to go on the boat where there's a real, very real risk that the bomb is going to land on you? Like, if you're smart, you know... No chance. Three weeks. <laughs> That's all you have to have heard the loss of a fleet. Yeah. I'm just, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of like a captain of, of a minor ship, like a frigate or something that's in this fleet, just knowing what's about to happen, being completely unable to do anything about it and being the only person in your chain of command that knows what's about to happen. Yeah, your liquor cabinet is taking serious damage. <laughs> yeah. Every, everybody else is just like, uh, like bored and they look over and the captain is like fully drenched his suit in sweat. White knuckles on the railing as he stares at the ship that's launching. Captain, it's just a surface terror missile. What are you so worried about? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing, son. Don't worry about it, he says <laughs> through gritted teeth. Looking over at every other officer, like, it was an honor to serve with you. What? <laughs> his sweat has like emulsified his cigar he's, i'm going to shield myself <laughs> he's deep he's, he's just in the officer's mess legs on the tape feet on the table <laughs> so, uh, captain what's going on it's casual friday tell them it's all tell them discipline doesn't matter anymore god has forsaken us eggs and bacon for everyone <laughs> He's treating all of them like it's their last day on Earth, and he's just being incredibly nice to every sailor he meets. The captain's at the helms of their ships, and then the ocean starts speaking Latin. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Ominous Latin chanting intensifies. Argus launches. Now, I don't want to disappoint people, but things did not, like, in the actual launches, things did not go as badly as people might oh, expect. Oh, thank God. But they didn't go great. They, they, they still went very bad. Oh. This is 
failure to launch after all. We don't talk about successes, except when we do occasionally. And after all of the risks we just talked about, you would be amazed that Task Force 88 wasn't immediately turned into floating scrap. When the Task Force reached the launch site, they also got to deal with the weather. Admiral Mustin, the head of the Task Force, explained it like this. We, on the other hand, had to launch it from the deck of a ship. It's kind of a cliche to say from the deck of a rolling ship till you stop and figure what the forecasts are for weather in that part of the world. Almost any time of the year, you name it, that part of the world is pretty uncompromising. Down in that part of the Atlantic, there's practically no data because nobody goes there. The weather is so lousy. The average wind force was gale. Huh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So, so they're, they're out there. They're in like permanent hurricane typhoon weather. And the ship is rocking back and forth, and they need to get the rocket to go straight up perfectly. A rocket that doesn't have guidance. Yeah, I did the math, and it's still going to get pushed around by the wind once it's launched. But with a target altitude of 800 kilometers, every one degree that the rocket is like tilted will throw it off course by about 15 kilometers, which for what they're doing is pretty big. Someone got talked down uh, from trying to press the button at the right moment as their boat rocked, I'm sure of it. <laughs> it's just like turning my head sideways and squinting to like try and line it up as I am about to press the big red button. Did you say that every degree that it's off is, is 15 kilometers? 15 kilometers, yes. <sighs> and it, it goes off a lot more by one degree. Um, so over about a week in late August and early September 1958, there were three Argus shots, all of them launched from the deck of the USS Norton Sound, an old seaplane tender. Hey! Yeah, so they're, they're just crammed on that little deck in the back. I think there's like a little hangar to the right of it. And they're just, they put the rocket out. You can see it in uh, slide 16 and they launch it. I believe that is Argus 1 because it immediately veers. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's quite a tilt. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The first attempt, Argus 1, launched fine, but veered extremely off course. By the time it detonated, it was about a thousand kilometers from where it was supposed to be and nowhere near a useful altitude. Also, fun side note, even though the nuke timer never would have made it that far, it was on track to hit Brazil. I checked. Well done. I, mm. <laughs> Great work. Accidentally starting you could have won with Brazil. <laughs> We've got to get it out before the tight line. Even though the launch had been a failure, the crews described the flash in the sky as beautiful, and Explorer 4 was still able to pick up some signs that the magnetic field was trapping some of the nuclear particles, just like Christophilos had predicted. Wow, that <laughs> yeah, I'm amazed was very at this pretty. point the crew has not realized what is going on, especially because a lot of the other ships in the like formation, they are set up in this huge blocking pattern all around the Norton Sound. Like they are. Uh, dozens of kilometers out preventing anyone from getting near they cannot be within like range of this so argus 2 was also a dud it stayed on course but probably had some kind of failure with the third stage it only reached an altitude of 300 kilometers before detonating far lower than expected and the crew didn't even get to see a cool flash because of how thick the cloud cover was which kind of gives you an idea like the cloud cover is so thick it blocks an atomic bomb <laughs> what the hell i mean what's the point of sailing all the way down into the ocean you don't even get to see the flashes from your cool missiles. So with Argus 2 a failure, the crew of the Norton Sound were down to their last nuke. The Argus, uh, if the Argus 3 launch didn't work perfectly, the entire program would go to waste and that damn test moratorium meant that they might never be able to try again. Which I always find it funny, like, I, we have very rarely had the pressure to get something done in this show be something that is good. And all of these guys are like, God damn it. I won't be able to test nuclear bombs anymore. Like, oh, uh, if I, if we don't get this done right now, the arms race is going to stop guys. Do you understand? Do you understand what's at stake? Can you imagine the tongue lashing that the, the missile techs and the scientists got when the first two launches failed? Oh, I, like I, I'm sure it would have been ridiculous. The amount of swearing. They would have left that conference room faces stained with cigarette ash. <laughs> <laughs> Stick it of cheap wine be thrown over them. Now, on September 6th, 1958, Argus 3 was rolled out and set up on deck. As the wind pitched the ship back and forth and the countdown reached zero, the ship's captain pressed the launch button and nothing happened. Uh-oh. One of the Navy missilemen, Dick Culp, remembered it like this. It was like four, five, six minutes gone by. We were all sitting there thinking, okay, we've got a two kiloton nuclear warhead sitting on top of a three-stage rocket in the South Atlantic in a storm. 
What was the best way to get the damn thing off the fantail without obliterating everyone within five miles? You literally can't make this up. No, no one would believe that this was real if it was in fiction. It just, just tilt it and push it. Yeah, and th- this is also not an isolated thing. Um, in the Soviets, they had a similar incident to this whenever uh, Korolev was doing his first tests of the uh, R-7 ballistic missile. They had some kind of scenario where they were using a crane to like put the warhead onto the rocket. And then something messed up and the like the crane broke. The warhead wound up precariously dangling like nose down about to detonate. And they had to like do some kind of weird Looney Tunes shit to prevent it destroying uh, Baikonur. And that same level of inventiveness and Looney Tunes perseverance pays off here because the technicians were able to like disarm the nuke and then figure out what went wrong with the rocket. Some incredibly brave technician went out onto the launch pad <laughs> to find out what was going on, didn't yeah. they? It would, it would be instantaneous for him, you know? One, one moment he's working on a bomb and the next is nothing. Yeah, you know? like, it, do, it doesn't matter if you're inside the little hangar uh, like 10 meters away. You're, you're equally brave. Now, trying to defuse some of the we almost nuked ourselves tension, one of the captains of a nearby destroyer in the task force sent the Norton Sound a matchbook with the note, maybe this will help because the rocket had just like failed to ignite. Please get this away from us. Yeah, and this is one of the ships that is assigned to be close by, so they they don't have the option of running. Now, when they tried again, Argus 3 flew perfectly. Its nuke went off at an altitude of almost 800 kilometers, every search plane was able to track its progress, and the Explorer 4 satellite picked up the cloud of particles from the detonation cleanly. I know we talked about the sight of a bomb going off in space with Argus 1, but I want to quote from an observer from the nearby USS Albemarle to give you an idea of like just how cool this must have been to see. Quote, the effect began as a blue-green spear starting close to the horizon, climbing in back of a cloud and reappearing above the cloud. The effect first appeared about a half minute after detonation. A short time after the onset of the effect, a red crown developed at the head of the bluish spear. The red was distinct, but not as bright as the green. For the next minute, the red spread out while the blue-green lost intensity. The red aurora deepened in color, began to fade, and after four minutes was no longer visible. The blue-green spread out and became an indistinct luminous glow, covering about 45 degrees of horizon up to 30 degrees high. The glow slowly faded and was gone about 32 minutes after the aurora began. The brightest part of the display was extremely intense as the edges of the cloud which obscured the center of the display were outlined clearly, as if the moon were behind the clouds. So I, I also don't have the best like visual idea. I can't picture that in my head, having read it. Nuclear space tests are extremely trippy. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, at what point did people not think they'd broken the sky? Yeah. <laughs> This is how religions are. These are, uh, I believe, from the 1960s, um, because spoiler alert, the test ban does not last. And and yeah, just like you you create this artificial aurora borealis. The aurora, oh, the aurora Christophilos. There he is. (laughs) (laughs) I was just thinking about people in the south, in south of South America being like, what's going on on out of the ocean? Don't worry, the Americans are just getting weird with it. And then like a bunch of glowing ships make their way to Rio a week later. (laughs) Just a light blue tinge all around. Now, in the end, Nick Christophilos' ideas were vindicated. When the Argus nukes went off, the magnetic sphere grabbed those particles and trapped them exactly like he said they would. They even observed some of the death cloud formation that he thought could protect America from Soviet nukes. Today, physicists know this phenomenon as the Christophilos effect. However, that doesn't mean Operation Argus was a success. Our parents didn't spend the Cold War sitting under radioactive death clouds, or within the atomic Snuggie. You read my mind. (laughs) The Christophilos effect is a real thing, but it turns out it's not as strong as Nick wanted it to be. The particles weren't trapped long enough, they dissipate too quickly, and they don't stay in a dense enough cloud for the idea to actually be useful for defense or offense. So it does exist. As a weapon, it is thankfully a flop. Because, yeah, like we said, otherwise our parents could have grown up um, looking at the green-tinged sky. And we would have forearms. What a shame. Also, I don't believe I mentioned it before, but the original plan, if this would have worked, because while Task Force 88 was doing all their stuff, a whole bunch of scientists and military guys were planning like, all right, well, when Operation Argus inevitably works and this is, you know, we all go under the death cloud, they knew that the death cloud would um, like dissipate over time. 
So the plan was to regularly top it up by just launching more nukes into oh, it. Oh. So just every every month or so, they says, "Oh, Death Cloud needs a top up." <laughs> just just throw a couple more ICBMs up. Yeah, like yeah. being being an American citizen, but being pissed because ah, oh, the Death Clouds like oh, the Death Clouds weaker than it used to be. We're picking up Russian transmissions again. Back in my day, I couldn't even see the sun. Basically, back, back in my day, the sky didn't even have a texture. Mr. President, build up the death cloud. <laughs> so, despite confirming Christophilos' findings, Operation Argus was wound down and cancelled, with a total cost of around 120 million current 2024 US dollars. The nuclear test moratorium went into effect in November of 1958, but it only lasted until 1961. When that happened, for two years, the Soviets and Americans raced to test all of the bombs that they had been saving up including a number of space tests. Now, these boom years for nuclear testing would end in 1963 with the signing of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Long story short, like all through the Cold War, these guys have repeatedly been just like attempting to do little bans and then breaking them. Uh, the initial moratorium, the Soviets broke it first, and I believe it was because the French had done their first nuclear test. <laughs> and the Soviets were basically just like, all right, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Uh, we're breaking the treaty. But at the same time, I, I'm pretty sure I read that um, like one week later, America also did a test, so they couldn't have been too surprised. Oh, no, that test was guaranteed in the pipe. Ready <laughs> yeah, like to go. All, of, all of those guys for two years, someone was sitting with their finger poised over the red button, just like, come on, man, one more nuke, one more nuke. Just let me test one more time. Just let me test one more nuke. We will solve the Cold <laughs> War. Just one more nuke. Uh, <laughs> Mr. President, just, please. Just sweating the hardest a man ever has. Just going, please let me poke it. <laughs> uh, now, for his part, Nicholas Christophilos gained a lot of fame and cachet from Operation Argus, even if it stayed a state secret until the 80s. He translated a lot of that fame into support for his Astron fusion reactor program that he worked on for the rest of his life. But by the 1970s, Astron was in trouble. It was years behind schedule millions over budget, and it had an administration getting, you know, pretty clearly ready to shut it down. Quote, Always a workaholic, Christophilos was driving himself and his assistants through 12-hour days, punctuated only occasionally by after-hours drinking bouts at local bars. And then, whenever it became clear that Astron was about to be shut down, on September 24th, 1972, Nicholas Christophilos died of a massive heart attack. Astron followed him a few months later. So Astron also had a massive fatal heart attack. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's why the Nevada pit is there. And we all remember that day. Listen, the Astron Corporation was just a horcrux of <laughs> Mr. Christophilus. <laughs> Nick Christ going out in the way only a Mediterranean man could. Now, I didn't want to write that ending that way. With a lot of these guys, Korolev uh, is a very good example as well. They work themselves to death. You know, these workaholic rocket guys, they wind up just like going, going, going until like Korolev dies from surgical complications because his heart is so weak. Christophilos gets his project canceled and then just his heart just gives out. Audience and Chris's and our guest, I want you to remember him for the death cloud he tried to give us instead of the fusion reactor he, he didn't give us. I'm truly a king. <laughs> and that, guys, is the story of Operation Argus, the plan to build the nuclear Snuggie over America. How do we all feel? Man, it really, it, really, it really ended as quickly as it started, huh? Suddenly, there was a childhood genius from Greece, and he grew up to become an elevator repairman. And he was like, I can make a particle accelerator better than those people. And then Sputnik hire me. happened. Hire me for your American job, <laughs> and I will come to America to work my American job for my American dollars. The way you're saying this, I'm just picturing Borat. Or I, I could easily see an Operation Argus movie where Nick Christophilos is just played by Sasha Baron Cohen. Oppenheimer 2. <laughs> Oppenheimer. No, Oppenheimer 2, The Greek Connection. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the terrifying thing for me really is seeing how absolutely cavalier that testing schedule was and knowing that that is just the tip of the iceberg. And, 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 we, and we've seen it so many times, like normally for the Soviets, it's rushing something to get it done for like the holidays or propaganda value. I love that for the Americans, they're rushing to get it done. And like the thing that will happen if they don't get it done is 
nuclear disarmament and peace. <laughs> Listen, guys, they're going to make another ball beep at us. <laughs> and we need a damn cloud. If I, if I have to listen to that radio one more time, if I have to know there's a dog up there one more time. Oh, that one still hurts a little. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Every time I try and talk about a fun space thing, it inevitably becomes sad because space is full of sadness. I love how it's, I think that was a really great way to put it. It's like, what will happen to uh, the American government if they don't get this done in time? We'll be foiled by our worst Jeez. nemesis. <laughs> the Soviets, sir? No. Peace. Ugh. <laughs> Damn peace. They, they, I mean, they did keep manufacturing nuclear warheads, so they're just like, yeah, it's big. Mr. President, like, have you told the president that, like, the storage rooms are filling up? We, we, we have too many nukes. We need to test them to keep the numbers down. Too many nukes? That's un-American. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I mean, that is, that is also just, like, the attitude behind the um, Project Orion rocket. The idea that you could just, like, propel a rocket by throwing nukes out the back of it and just riding the explosion wake. When you originally told me about Project Argus, I confused it with Project Orion. Oh, yeah. I mean, equally stupid. No, Orion is so much stupider. Yeah, but I like Operation Argus because it has like this cool physics thing, especially because the Christophilos effect is real. That's fascinating. If you detonate a nuke in orbit and you do it at a very specific spot, it will form a cloud over a different spot. If you detonate a nuke in the Pacific, it will make a cloud over the U.S. That is provable. It is truly amazing. The amount of just material. Meanwhile, Project Argus is, oh, sorry, Project Orion is just nuclear surfing. You know, there's no physics. There's no, there's no sci-fi supervillain hey, shit. What's more comfortable to the American public, the thermonuclear Snuggie or riding the blast? <laughs> <laughs> you definitely market why, that why is this just like a presidential debate? <laughs> it's just like, I want to hide America under the death cloud and I want to put America, we are going to drive America into orbit with the nuclear bombs. All right, what if we bury the atomic bombs under America? I don't know why I'm doing Kennedy. And get all of it into space. <laughs> Put the nukes in space. Oh, good. I'm pretty sure, like, the fastest man-made object was a manhole lid. I've heard of this, yeah. Yeah, and, like, that's just going to be America. America is just going to be the cork in the atomic bottle. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is your president. Hold on to something. <laughs> <laughs> we've trained for this <laughs> everybody assume the position <laughs> it's just like yeah it's just the duck and cover <laughs> all right everybody lay down and buckle up let's see what this country can do <laughs> we're propelling the u.s into orbit watch this <laughs> she's the size of china but she handles like brazil <laughs> why are we so that stupid maneuver just cost us rhode island <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well, that's the staging. You have to you have to shed the outer states as you go. Oh, uh, God, that would be cool. Like Spaceship America. Isn't that just that's a Doctor Who? I'm pretty sure Spaceship Britain is a Doctor Who episode. Yeah, Spaceship Britain is a Doctor Who episode. Except they used like a weird whale and, and America would just use nukes. That's their way. And then it would just have a big arm. <laughs> Ontario would just be the arm tacked onto the side and that would be Canada's the contribution. Canada's arm on a national level. <laughs> it's just muscles, but every Canadian is an individual muscle cell moving it. The entirety of Canada shall flex. God, why is, why, yeah, this is my new, like, I desperately want to do the world building for if we launched every country into space, how would they do it? And like, what would their space society be? <laughs> yeah, Nepal is easy. They just walk a few steps upwards and then well, fair, with yeah. them, you could create the Thunder Dragon <laughs> Empire. They called it Project Argus, but the outcome was disastrous we had to flee the planet <laughs> chris i think you're oh, thinking yes. of Bhutan. sorry you, you're right please please get your himalayan nations Listen, under i got control. my hearts and uh. mind for alternate governments mixed up <laughs> god i i i dread the day that some kids are learning geography not just from hearts of iron but from like uh fucking kaiserreich <laughs> you need to pull asking. your hand off yeah. the lathe of heaven right now <laughs> or worse kaiser redux so I do have this, and I think this would be a good way to kind of end us off, uh, like talking about Nicholas Christophilos. And this is from uh, his boss, Herbert York. Nick was a remarkable idea man. The ideas were usually not good, but they were really remarkable in that they were the kind of ideas that nobody else had. Nick really was a genius in a very important sense. He often invented things that required two new ideas simultaneously. 
which is something that normally hardly anyone ever does. So, I mean, I guess I kind of understand. He invented the nuclear space rocket and the death snuggie at the same time. He was also the first man with a, you know, multi-threaded brain. <laughs> he could. So let's, let's not forget he perfected the particle accelerator. That is fair. Yeah, like his actual his actual achievements, I think in terms of like things that are still used today, his main achievement is the strong focusing principle that did legitimately allow us to like take particle physics to another level. And then he also like Operation Argus, the Christophilos effect. He did actually theorize that that is a real thing. Um, it's useless as a weapon, fortunately. But I don't know. He's a he's a weird dude. He's He's a, I believe his colleagues called him the crazy Greek. He'd have gotten Athens into space. I think considering the time period, he would have had a much less flattering nickname. Also, what would the, what would, what would oh, Greece's God, yeah. face be like? Uh, whatever method they would use, Turkey would said they would say they invented it first. Ooh. Greece in space is just a, or it's a cosmic ring. Well, you know? I, I mean, yeah. And at, at the same time, the Balkans in space, like within a week of launching, they would have all rammed each other just formed one ball no they would have destroyed each other they would have like relativistic impacted each other uh mutual annihilation I i'm gonna be thinking about this for like weeks i'm gonna be thinking about the world building of how every country would get to space like not just send their people but like physically get their landmass into orbit but also just like what that what that shattered earth but yeah Ross, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a blast. Thank you for having me. This has been, this has been a great one. Thanks for being here, Frost. And uh, where can people find your work? Uh, I'm on YouTube at youtube.com slash Frost. And um, yeah, it's all kind of very niche, weird strategy games and tactical games. Um, Our audience is weird niche. So audience, get over there. Giant flying battleships powered by liquid helium oh. um, or uh, just space battles. Check it out. Or my voice on a few of them. Yeah, uh, Quinn's been doing some... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to do a narrative playthrough of a game that hasn't got a narrative campaign in the moment, so I've got some people committing... Uh, not committing, <laughs> contributing voice overs for stuff, and Nick's been doing some great work as um, Commander Rubishaw. Uh, that's that's in um, Nebulous Fleet Command, which is basically oh. um, a, a naval combat game in three dimensions. Oh. Yeah, other Chris, have you not gotten into this yet? I feel like this would be right it, up your it alley. It does sound like... You're you're in you're into that like submarine game, Cold right? Waters, yeah. This is like that, but space. If if you if you if you, you were talking about SAH missiles earlier, if you like your missile designing, this game has a built-in missile designer where you can choose your different seeker warheads, um, including combining them, so you can have A rad and semi-active homing, for example, or infrared, etc. Why would you do this? I need him available for recording next <laughs> week. And thank you, audience, for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. Thank you to everyone who has signed up to support the show. And a big shout out to all of our top tier patrons. Our cyborg cats are Boss, Matt, Leaf Goose, and Spectre Cohen. Our space dogs, Ben L, Frankel Moonlight, Furious Luddite, John C, Oliver, Tom M, and Zim. Albert Count, seven. Thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to follow us, we are Failure to Launch on Blue Sky and FT Launch Pod on Instagram. We also post our episodes with visual aids at Failure to Launch Podcast on YouTube. All music was provided by DJ Danarchy.